And but got, you know what they say about a huge nose? Because it's a smell. Hey guys, before we get into it, I wanna thank the sponsor of today's episode, Colon Broom. Colon Broom is a high fiber dietary supplement that uses the highest quality ingredients to support your gut and microbiome health. In other words, if you're someone that suffers from an angry tummy, this might be for you. For example, if you're someone that suffers from diarrhea, the high fiber in colon broom will help solidify your bowel movements. Or on the flip side, say you're someone that suffers from constipation, it'll add bulk to your poop to help it move quicker along the digestive tract. And as someone who's incredibly lazy, I can honestly say that it's really easy to work into your daily routine. You just add a single scoop into a glass or bottle each day and it takes care of all the rest. In my own testimony, I can confirm that you will feel better after just like a day or two. Like a noticeable difference. And the best part on top of all the other stuff that it does is that you just you just feel lighter. And of course, as you all know, I don't poop. But if I did, I would probably say that it definitely makes that a much more pleasant endeavor as well. But colon broom can also help in other ways, such as bloating. Or maybe you just want to flush waste from your body for whatever reason. I find that most of the time supplements are kind of gross, but I actually like colon broom. I think it tastes good. Like mixing it up with water, it just tastes like a sweet juice but it's sweetened with stevia so that you don't have to worry about adding more sugar to your diet. So get your gut health back on track today because by using the link below, you can get up to 65% off with Colon Brew. And if you need a little extra push, you can use my coupon code MADDIE10 and take an additional 10% off the already existing discount. Again, that link can be found in the description or the pinned comment. And now, on to the video. Hi guys, welcome back to Give It To Me Straight where it's always time for a cocktail or six. And on the show today, we have the Real Housewife of Scranton, all the way from season seven in All Stars 8, Mrs. Kasha Davis. Woo! <laughs> welcome Thank to the, you. Welcome to the show. I think this is the first time I've ever seen you without Mr. Kasha Davis. Oh, Mr. Davis. he's Somebody's got to hold down the fort mm -hmm. and take care of our dog, our yep. husky, at home. All and right. the spreadsheets. And the spreadsheets. The spreadsheets. He's in charge of all the finances, you know. Like, so you just do, you play dress up and gallivant around with your friends and he does the work. The he does the actual work. He yeah, yeah, yeah. The, yeah, the yeah. real job, yeah. Yeah. I did <laughs> enough of that years ago. Now it's time for fun. Yeah, behind every great woman is someone who's actually doing a job. <laughs> oh, Actually. I mean, you know, it's teamwork. You know, it's the same in your, in your life, in your relationship. Yeah, I work hard. I work like a dog day and night. Oh. <laughs> I love, though, that you've got the retro look, and I've worked with two fabulous people who said, you've got to dress younger if you're going to be on Maddie's mm -hmm. show. And so they, no. they, they put this, I was like, okay, I feel like an ice skater. Like, I, I should be getting ready for, like, <laughs> mm -hmm. the, the, I don't know what it is, but just sparkles and fabulous. And you just, this is classic beauty right here. I, well, I, I assumed when you were going to come on the show, I was like, she'll probably wear some, like, 60s, 70s. Right. You know, but in the, so I tried to dress appropriately, and then you, you know. And I was like, let me see if I can mess with that. Yeah, you bumped it up a decade or so. <laughs> I know. But, you know. We're in the 70s, early 70s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. We're kind of like, we're right around the same time. <laughs> we're definitely two people that existed around the same era. Right. One was a little more progressive, one a little bit more, yeah. you know, conservative. You look, well, you look wealthier, as a matter of fact. I look wealthier? I look like I'm trying harder. Yeah. You know, because it's whatever people that dress flashier are usually the ones that can't afford it. They can't afford you know? it. They're trying harder. Yeah. Yeah. And I wear this, and that's why I drive a, you know, a Mercedes, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just a very wealthy kindergarten That's teacher right. because they actually got paid back then. But did you do this hair? Um, I I put a hairspray in it today. Yes. Okay, very good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> a workhorse queen. Workhorse. Uh, now a friend of mine, uh, Hella Wigs. Nice. Yeah, I've Wiggs heard of Hella Wigs. This is Hats by Carlos, and this is Lucy and Donna, and then this is you know, Scranton, Pennsylvania. <laughs> mm -hmm. What's the uh, uh, what's that, what's that sunscreen with the baby on it and the dog? What's it called? Um, I can't remember. I know what you mean. Copper tone. Copper tone. Yeah, just, it's just copper tone. Copper just, tone, yeah. Yeah, a little sheen on the leg. A little there. bit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so despite the catchphrase that you always use of it's always time for a cocktail, you've actually been sober since 2015, almost yes. eight years now. Yeah, just eight years this summer, working on nine, one day at a time. Mm -hmm. Greatest gift that came out of RuPaul's Drag Race. Sobriety? Sobriety. Oh my gosh. I, I thought went back to All Stars sober, I probably, probably would have drove me back to drink in. <laughs> I mean, it was definitely sobering, you know, <laughs> the idea that you're there and I'm with somebody who's my best friend and we're there all together and th it's back into that like reality. You're like, did I really say yes to this again? Mm -hmm. But it's such a marvelous opportunity. Let's face the facts. I mean, you get projected back out into the world and uh, being there sober and watching the others kind of like drown their sorrows and, uh, and untucked. It's, it's kind of fun. It's kind of fun being there and being clear. Yeah. 
And I'd be able to remember what happened is great for confessionals <laughs> too. So, right, you know, yeah. It's good to have the information. But with your catchphrase being that it's always time for a cocktail and you being a sober person, do you feel like you are just an enabler at this point, like just encouraging <laughs> everyone else? Because you're like, I'll be the DD, so yeah, it's always exactly. time for a cocktail. Honestly, there's always time for a cocktail has been a gift. I encourage people to have a great time and do their thing. It was time for me to take a look at it. It was mm -hmm. really, I was killing myself. I was anesthetizing to just stay immobilized, not going through the things that I needed to go emotionally. Uh, go through emotionally and not sort of facing some of those realities. And some of those realities came from post season seven of Drag Race. I left my job of 18 years mm -hmm. in this management position to be a full time artist and the gigs weren't coming in. But what I didn't realize at the time was that it was this August sort of like heading into that time period where sometimes the gigs slow down. Mm -hmm. It's cyclical. cyclical. So I didn't realize that. I was just in this comparison mode and I felt like I was failing my husband and my family, the kids, because I wasn't be able to earn and it just was, it just, just spiraled. Mm -hmm. So because of Drag Race and because of the, the opportunity to be on there, it helped me to follow what I love and also to address that addiction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, now that you mentioned it, I didn't realize that your sobriety happened like around the time that you had just left the show. So that timeline right. adds up, makes a little more sense now. Yeah. So it was like, you know, we were busy from the tours and they, you know, go around and we had the Vegas, Paris uh, rooftop showing of drag race and all these, all these events. And then n crickets, mm -hmm. there was nothing. And sometimes that happens. I mean, there are at this point 500 queens that have been on RuPaul's Drag Race. Mm -hmm. And there are many other fabulous queens who have not even auditioned who are out there and we're all yeah. vying for this. The, for the gigs, for the brunch gigs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, we're fi fighting for those, fighting for those, uh, you know, ten dollars. <laughs> oh my gosh, <laughs> we need a union. Is what we need. We need a union. We need people to take a look at see seeing a, you know, some equal la wages for queens. Every, you know, every time a drag queen tries to start some kind of union, something always happens. I'll yeah, I was on here with Irene recently, and she was talking about how they tried to start one in Seattle, and it just, you know. <sighs> Well, I think the fact of the matter is the queens just, uh, we exist in, sometimes we just want to get up on stage. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we don't really care. Sometimes people are scraping, you know, to put $2 together and they become more creative because of it. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, though, that the, the fact of the matter is we've got drag race girls making this much money and then we have other girls who are lucky to get 40 bucks and a drink ticket. And it's like... There's got to be a, a middle ground. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Something a little bit closer. Yeah, you're like, someone has to make less money than me. That's just trickle-down economics. <laughs> exactly. You know? yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on now. Yeah. <laughs> That's why you have a queen from the Reagan era. It's you, exactly. Yeah. It, yeah. yeah. No, that's, I mean, no, honestly, I want to see people who are now really diving into this and looking at, as, looking at it as a business to understand that they can ask for more, to understand that they are the reason why people are going to the club mm -hmm. or to the brunch. They're not coming for the eggs. They're coming right. for the queens, the legs and eggs. Well, it depends. Yeah, <laughs> it depends. So I think that is important for the for the artist to realize that and to take a look at the fact that they have that worth mm -hmm. and then to understand the cycles of things and to understand that they've really got to get out there and, and do the work and find the find the work. Mm -hmm. So with your sobriety, are you now just uh, Mr. Kasha Davis's forever DD? Whenever he, he's <laughs> at a little too much Merlot? I know, right? Well. Sometimes, I mean, honestly, because of the fact that we share so much of our life and we're just such a, a team, uh, he still drinks, but not as much as he used to. I mean, mm -hmm. I think he drank more back when I was drinking so much just to keep up with, like, what the heck was happening. Oh, okay. You know, and so as he's gotten older and just has experienced some of my sobriety by proxy, he's sort mm -hmm. of like, you know. Yeah. It doesn't drink as much. Drink is, drink is not as fun whenever you're the only one doing it. So, right. You know. <laughs> well, back in my day, I mean, no, I honestly, I couldn't be happier. It was, it was, and I'm very glad to be very open about it because mm -hmm. you never know who's watching and who might say to themselves, is it possible to be sober, mm -hmm. whether they're a performer or not? Just the idea is like, is, can I have a life? Can I have fun and enjoy each day being sober? And yes, you can. Mm -hmm. And so that's that's important to me that I'm able to to show that and to to show that process. Yeah, to be a good influence in one way at least. In one way, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's not it's not going to be in the drag, or certainly not the clothes that I make, as we know. Right. <laughs> but, hey, 
<laughs> who are you telling? Who are you right? Telling? I mean, it's, you, know? you know, we can open our own uh, costume shop, but we're going to go under in the first week. Yeah. <laughs> Like some queens make garments, we make do. That's right. right <laughs> well, you know, you heard my saying. It's like, listen, I'm not Amish and I have good credit. Why should I make the clothes, right? right there it is. There, I, uh, truly. <laughs> Why would I do that? I, you know, if somebody says, you, you know, you need a new carpet. Well, let me, you know, uh, weave one together. No, I'll go buy a carpet mm -hmm. <laughs> because somebody does it better than I do. Right. So that's how, I, I mean, this, this idea that drag queens have to be able to do everything on their own uh, in terms of creating their look that mm -hmm. way it's crazy. I think we should dive into it and have some experience, but that's just my little yeah. Be able, to be able that. to you know sew a hole together whenever the Amazon right. dress comes in and it's not you know <laughs> yeah 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 yeah. This is bare bare minimum. Yeah, a little darning. Yeah, do the bare minimum. Said the workhorse queen. Exactly. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> uh, but uh, mentioning your husband, for those that don't know, his Mr. Kasha Davis is not his government name, but your correct. Husband, your husband Stephen. His name is Stephen. Yeah. How, how long have y'all been together now? We are now working on twenty-one years. Oh my gosh. Yeah. That's crazy. It's crazy. It's we look at each other sometimes and we're like sitting in our recliners opposite each other, watching television, uh, eating skinny pop popcorn. Because there's only thirty nine calories per cup. Just so you know, I have the whole bag. I could fit that into one cup. Mm -hmm. And we sit there just, and I just think, my gosh, this truly is my dream come true. To be with somebody where there's just no pressure, and it's just we are exactly who we are, enjoying just the moment. Mm -hmm. He's, he's amazing. But he wasn't your only relationship because you had been married prior. Yes. You were married to a woman for 10 years. I was. Your high school sweetheart. Why didn't that work out? Was it just compatibility or? Well, I. The one that got away. I absolutely loved Anne Marie and still do to this day. She and I were high school sweethearts. I was figuring out who I was. I wasn't sure what. Everybody else had decided I was gay mm -hmm. before I did. I mean, I knew from a young boy, I always say, as a little boy, girl, gal, girl, boy, fella. Yeah. I knew I was different because everybody pointed it out. Yeah. Oh, you're light in the loafers, is what they used to say. Uh, he, Eddie, our, our son, Eddie, he's a fairy. And they would insist that I speak in a lower tone, that I didn't like fancy things, I didn't like frilly things. And so from that young age, I always knew that I had to suppress this feminine aspect of myself. Mm -hmm. And so I did what everybody wanted me to do. And I did. I married the first girl who would say yes. Mm -hmm. But we did love each other. And we had a wonderful time in the majority of that marriage. And then it was time for us to take a look at our compatibility. I mean, I was definitely realizing that I was gay. I'd come out to her. Her first response to me was, you're just very European. We'll deal with it. <laughs> what? What, and I think what she was saying is like, you know, at the time, we're talking like late 80s, early 90s, mm -hmm. this was the idea that, well, you know, maybe you were bisexual. But we, nobody talked about this in Scranton, Pennsylvania. Nobody was looking at the fact that you could be even open and out and uh, gay, bisexual, or anything but straight. Yeah. And so that's, that's what I did. In the 80s and, in Scranton, like, bisexuality hadn't even hit there yet. Like, like, <laughs> no, yeah. homosexuality hadn't hit there. Trust me, I was in a ballet company and we were all, everybody who was any kind of, like, appeared anything other than straight, mm. definitely you had to be kept in a closet. Mm -hmm. And it's just the way it was. Yeah. And we we're talking about a time when it was also the AIDS epidemic. So people thought if you were gay in these ignorant small towns, you would just die of AIDS. Mm -hmm. If you just said you were gay. Yeah. So uh, she found her way with someone else, and of course I did as well, and we made the decision to divorce. And God bless her, she's passed away. She's uh, oh, I'm sorry. a couple years ago. And uh, she ended up with a, a lovely husband and has two great kids. So it's a sad situation. But we never really reconnected. And that, that, that's one thing that in my life, I don't believe in regrets, that, but it breaks my heart that we never really were able to reconnect and kind of laugh mm -hmm. at that. I mean, we got married at 20 and 21. Yeah. But as you're saying, so, so you were around your 30s or so whenever you officially divorced. Um, but with that, like, like, what years, how many years, like, did you guys stay married knowing, like, the situation? So we were together from 88 to 98. Mm -hmm. And I think probably before I got married, which was 93, is when I came, first came out to her. Oh, so you came out before you even got married. Yeah. So she went 10 years knowing that, like, that was something. Right. Yeah. And we were, 
like the best of friends. We had the best time together. Mm -hmm. And we loved life together. But, and we were semi-compatible in the bedroom. But we weren't fulfilling our, our heart's desire, mm -hmm. either one of us. So who, who initiated that conversation of like, I think we should really focus on ourselves. It's been a good run, but now let's live our authentic, real lives. She was working to be uh, a Spanish teacher and she was studying internationally. And that's where she had met her husband that she ended up with. And we made the decision to sell our home. We had this beautiful five bedroom home and we had this crazy, crazy life together and a good successful business. And all of a sudden we sold that, got an apartment. I just came home one day and she was gone. And she left me this note that said it was time for us to move on. And she's like, you know, I've officially gone to formalize a divorce. And so I thought it was the most hateful note. But years later in my sobriety journey, I wanted to make amends to her. And I'm, of course she's passed. And all of a sudden I just had this desire to go to that journal. And I found that note and it was the most loving, beautiful note. And it was the idea of, I love you. And, but I also love myself and we need to do this. Mm. We need to follow our paths. And you know that this is right. And it was beautiful. And it was just that, that perfect kind of realization that, you know, it was a different perspective and a different time. Mm -hmm. But uh, you need to look, look back at it with a different pair of lenses to really appreciate the, the meaning behind it. There was so much love there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I, I, so I get divorced. It's 90, 1998. I decide to come out to my parents. My father spits in my face. My mother's all kinds of dramatic. And they made the statement of disowning me. And so I moved to, uh, in the process, I had moved to Rochester, New York. And that's where I built the family from the gay bars. Mm -hmm. And it was surrounded around, you know, those nights going out to drink and that camaraderie of my family disowned me and some of my friends disowned them and some broken families. And we put, cobbled together this family and it was it was the start of a, of a whole new family. They, my parents eventually came around, but mm -hmm. that was a very, very tough time. And I really dove into the gin bottle at the time. Yeah. But that was where you met some of your future friends, such as um, Darian Lake, Pandora Box, and even your future husband, Stephen. Yes. Right? So the good came out of that, that finding myself, finding my family, standing on my own. And I think my parents came around to me because of the fact that I was confidently being myself. And they started realizing, well, they have no power here. They have no control. Mm -hmm. Eddie is going to be exactly who he is. Yeah. And so, yeah, I would go out to see the shows and at Mother's, it was the club. Uh, Darian would be on stage doing a Wonder Woman number, uh, just dancing her ass off and just a little leotard. Pandora comes out with this extra long mix that was all kind of comedy and fabulous. And Aggie Dune and Ambrosia Salad and Naomi Kane, all of these queens. I was just fascinated by them, mm -hmm. but I didn't see myself doing it. I was a theater fella who could relate to the showmanship of it, mm -hmm. but I didn't say, I was like, I can't be, I, I don't, I don't understand how to be pretty. I don't, I don't get it. Mm -hmm. Well, neither did they, so. <laughs> I know. They were just a bunch of whores. <laughs> uh, still are. So, and honestly, but they were. I mean, they were, they were embodying like, these fabulous, curvaceous, sexy divas and impersonations of Cher and Madonna and stuff. And I was like, how do I fit into that? Until I saw Miss Richfield 1981. Mm -hmm. And my husband and I saw her in P-Town. And when I saw her, I was like, oh, she's a man in a dress. And she's telling a story. And it's a cabaret. And there's a message. And it's singing live. And theatrical and I was like I can fit into the show mm -hmm. of this cast of characters of Aggie, Ambrosia, Pandora, Darian, Naomi and I could be that character that's just a little bit different and mm -hmm. and you know make a full rounded show. Yeah. What like with the housewife thing, one of the I think integral parts of your drag is that you always have your plus one. Right. Steve of Mr. Kasha Davis and that's been the way ever since the beginning. <laughs> that's the first the be night. The first time. That is our like, yours looks so ravishing in plastic <laughs> pearls. Isn't that fantastic? Which good, so, where, where, where'd you find that dress? The you old, just almost said it. Good the Goodwill. Mm -hmm. And here's the thing. Okay. That wig is Stevens from his Halloween costume of doing Wonder Woman. So he was like this Wonder Woman costume. And I said, I think I'm going to do drag. And I went and I found this lime green dress. Mm -hmm. And it's a maternity outfit. It was the only thing that I that could find that would fit me. And I had hairy arms, so I wore gloves. Miss Richfield wore gloves. And my first song was Lime Jello Marshmallow Cottage Cheese Surprise. And it was about this housewife who just made this fabulous dish. And he was there right from the beginning. I mean, we created Mrs. Kasha Davis and Mr. Davis, of course, together. Mm -hmm. So... 
I just know for a fact somewhere out there, there's a couple of videos of you doing the I Love Lucy, like, mmm, it's tasty too. Absolutely. Like, 100% done that number. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, that's the, the, the idea was back then it was like an homage to, an homage to the 60s and 70s, an mm -hmm. homage to the housewife. My mother was that epitome of that housewife who was frustrated with the fact that she had to do, take care of five kids in, in the house, but she wanted to have a career too. Mm -hmm. And I loved to see her just like go at my dad and be like, you know, I'm making just as much as money as you are and you need to help out. And they would just have this, mm -hmm. this battle, but she'd go out there and be successful. And I loved that. I loved to see a strong woman. But in addition to becoming a husband, you also became a father because whenever you married Stephen, he had two daughters. But what was it like being both a father and a drag queen? Oh my gosh. Well, first and foremost, when he first came to me and said, he's like, I need to talk to you. I thought it was the friend conversation. I was like, this is it. He's, he's dumping me. Mm -hmm. And he said, uh, I have two daughters. And I literally was like, oh my gosh, this is a dream come true. Because in my coming out journey, in my story, mm -hmm. I was devastated because I saw no one in a gay relationship adopting or having children back then. It just wasn't something that I saw. It was probably happening, of course it was, but I never saw it. So I didn't see that it was possible to have a family, to have children, and this was huge for me. I always dreamt of that Christmas morning with the kids. And so when he told me that, I was like, oh my gosh. So they were seven and nine, I think, at the time when I came into their life. And it was this one day I was sneaking out of the house to do drag after the kids went to bed. And I said, the next day I said, we're talking to the kids. I can't, I'm not sneaking around mm -hmm. anymore in my life in any way, shape, or form. Did, uh, th did his children know he was gay at that time too? Yes. Okay. So he had been divorced. Um, he had the same situation where he, you know, married one of his high school sweethearts. Yeah. And he made a little further than you did. He made a little further. He yeah. ended up having the kids. Uh, but we're about married at the same time, and our ex-wives are similar people. It was very interesting mm -hmm. in that respect. And, we, of course, we had that connection of having that marriage to a woman previously. And so uh, when we told the kids, they were like, okay, big deal. Like, you know, mm -hmm. it's a different time. They're, to them, it was not... And then it was so much fun, you know. Then they would put on shows for us. They would go down to the... Con Why didn't you tell us all this was in the basement, you know? Mm -hmm. And they'd come up and do a show and be like, I'm a crazy zookeeper with every, you know, animal print on or whatever else. And their mom didn't want them to wear heels uh, for whatever reason. She was worried they were going to get hurt. So we were like, okay, everybody's wearing heels this weekend because no kid of mine is going to the prom in flats, you know? <laughs> right. <laughs> That's not happening. So, and now our youngest just got married. So, Crazy. yeah, so she's married and we're waiting for kids. Mm -hmm. No pressure. Grandkids. Yes, I can't <laughs> wait to be grampy. Our kids did not have as much of an understanding of the queer community growing up, small town in upstate New York. Mm -hmm. And they ended up starting the first Gay Straight Alliance in their school. Oh, wow. And becoming, a, one is a school counselor for a while. She's now doing something else. Mm -hmm. And the other is a librarian and they do things in that respect that are just that make us so proud we know because of the experience they had mm -hmm. with their dads but being kids in like the early 2000s 2010 ish era obviously more progressive than like the 80s or 90s but there still was like some pushback politically socially did your daughters ever experience like bullying or like do you get weird stares from other parents because you were like in a gay relationship with children yeah i think they struggled at school if we would have say for instance um whatever School activity, and we all attended. Mm -hmm. So mom is there, dad is there, mom's boyfriend, and dad's boyfriend. And people are like, who's who? Mm -hmm. Who's on first? <laughs> you know, and yeah. people were just trying to understand, I think. And I, as they got in further into, into maybe middle school or high school, it was like there was one time where they're like, you know, could you stay home? And immediately afterwards, they're like, we never want to do that again. We're sorry. You know, they, they got some, some, some bullying and some feedback from some other students. But now I know that in their, our oldest daughter in dating, it's like, it's imperative that they find people that are like, first of all, like if you, you have any kind of inclination of having any kind of homophobia, that you're not going to, it's not going to work out in this family, mm -hmm. you know? So try to, trying to find guys that, uh, that are secure in themselves and, and interested in being a part of. Uh, a family like this is it, sometimes it was challenging for them mm -hmm. in their dating. It's a little bit more of a hurdle. 
A little bit. I think it was. And I think uh, it's, but it's, it's, it's a deal breaker, period. I mean, obviously, there's, there's no room for it in mm -hmm. our family. And now their mom and I are close. I mean, she asked me to attend the dress fitting for our daughter mm -hmm. to be there with her. She didn't need to do that. You know, that's how close we've become. We spend holidays together. We're just one big family. And that was really important to us because no matter what, the parents had decided and what, what route we were going on, it was important for us to make sure that we are there for them in every way, shape, or form and continue to be for future grandchildren mm -hmm. if they should have them. Yeah. Well, a lot of kids, whenever they threaten each other, they say, my dad could beat up your dad. Do you think they ever were ever like, well, I got two dads, so you better watch <laughs> out. I, think they were ever... I don't know if Steve and I are the beat up kind of... I mean, our daughters, I'll say that, you know, we get their mouth, their mouth from me. They're like, you know, mm -hmm. because I could be opinionated and, you know, we're drag queens. We, we're not afraid to say, mm -hmm. to say what we think. And I like that. I, as I mentioned earlier, I love confidence. Mm -hmm. uh, you're, no the, matter... you're the strong-willed woman in the yeah. household. That's right. I want yeah. them to speak up for themselves. I want them to, to, to be heard. I want them to understand that they don't, they don't need to be ashamed of mm -hmm. anything. And that's very important to me. And so I'm glad that I've had that influence on them. Sometimes when they snap back at me, though, I'm like, okay. <laughs> You're like, oh, <laughs> reel it in, queen. Reel it in. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Were you a mama's boy yourself? Oh, my gosh. The biggest mama boy, mama's boy ever. Mm. <laughs> I mean, I have, there are photos of me hanging onto my mother's leg. I, she, was, she was my queen. She was my everything. And her mother was in vaudeville. Mm -hmm. A whistler. A whistler. Mm-hmm. And the joke is, and boy, could she blow. I guess I'm a lot like her. Yeah. Oh, not that. <laughs> uh, but you, you mentioned, uh, like, we'll talk about your grandma in a minute, but we're it back uh, to your mom. Did a lot of her parenting style, did you, like, take that in and apply it to your own like, raising of children? I think so. It was so important to me to try to, to, to emulate some of the things that she did so beautifully, like Christmas. And uh, to this day, our kids... Uh, and, you know, they're your age. And I'll be like, well, Santa wants to know the list. Mrs. Claus called and it's important, you know. And so I kind of do some of that silly stuff that my mom used to do just to kind of keep the magic in in their hearts that way. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I believe I influence them in ways on how to keep their home and, and stuff like that. And, mm -hmm. and I think that's, you know, I think it's important. She's she's an angel, my mother. She's passed and she's She's always with me, and she's just really so interesting. Our daughter went to a psychic, and they just yesterday, and she was texting me as I was flying here, and she's like, um, "The psychic said there was this woman who came through, and she could sell, smell cigarette smoke." My mother was a big smoker, and she's just like, "When are the babies coming? When are the babies coming?" And it's totally my mother. You know, she's mm -hmm. kind of putting that pressure on too. <laughs> it's exactly how I am, and Steve's always like, "Back off a little bit," you know. I just said you're always like drawn to very strong with women like your mother. And your drag style was actually inspired by your mom and your grandmother, like those kinds of women. And your grandmother, as you said, was a vaudeville whistler. A vaudeville she was a whistler. A vaudeville whistler. There she is, Mae yeah. Miller. Look at that. You do you. I love how you do your research. Yeah. <laughs> I am so proud of this photo. I remember looking at this photo as the, a child and saying, I, I don't know. I want to be whatever she is in this photo. I don't know what she's doing. You know, at the time I was like, what is she doing? It looks like she's eating the microphone. But she was whistling and that's what she would do. She would host shows and get up there and whistle songs. She had her own radio program on uh, the, the Italian Hour in Scranton, Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. and the same as Channel 73. Like <laughs> Channel 73, yeah. And I mean, she performed at Radio City and uh, she ended up leaving performing mm. because she was with my mom and my uncle, and the, they were in the back seat, and my grandfather was driving, and they witnessed an accident where someone was decapitated. Oh, my God. And she was like, I can't be traveling around like this. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Well, <laughs> cars were a little less safe back then. Well, yeah. We got and there, so they, yeah. she got just, she was so scared, and then she ended up owning her own beauty salon. And so as a kid, I would mm -hmm. sit in the chair and swirl around and watch these ladies like get their hair done. And it was all yeah. that 1950s hairdos. Over at May Miller's. At May Miller's Beauty Salon. Mm -hmm. So uh, other than your mom and your grandmother and the old ladies at May Miller's Beauty Salon, how else was your drag character inspired by these women other than the fact that you dressed like a 1970s Avon lady? <laughs> other My than mom that. was an Avon lady. I'm sure you already know that. But honestly, the, it was the, the women on TV. It was 
Mrs. C from Happy Days. It was in the facts of life and, you know, girls, 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 you know, mm -hmm. these women, these characters, uh, Mrs. Jefferson. Mm -hmm. And I was just fascinated by all of these women and honestly, their, their outspokenness and their flamboyancy. Uh, Endora from Bewitched. You know, when I was a kid, I would I watch I thought you were about these. to say Andorra from the cartoon. I was like, I thought that was after your time. <laughs> yeah, 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 not Dora the cartoon. No, <laughs> Andorra from Bewitched. And I thought, like, oh, my gosh, I want to be, I would, like, that, if I were on TV someday, I want to be that character. And that's mm. kind of, like, the little sprinkles of, of uh, influences with Mrs. Koshadeh. Mm -hmm. Both you being so drawn to the women in your life, what was your relationship like with your father? Horrible. Oh. Absolutely horrible. Oh. Uh, from an early age, I can't remember a time when we got along. Uh, I always felt as though it was a disappointment. I was m named after him, and we just would butt heads. I think partly I was close with my mom. I was helping my parents take care of their kids, and she would kind of like manipulate, like, you're my favorite, and your father should be more like you. And I didn't realize some of the stuff she was doing was butting us against each other. Mm. And he was constantly trying to make me more masculine to the point of physical and verbal abuse. And it wasn't until I got sober that I took a look in the mirror and realized I was a part of this relationship. And if I forgave him, we had a chance. And we ended up having a really special last couple of years before he passed. And I was able to say, I love you. And he said it back. He came to see my, one of my performances, albeit it was at a Toyota dealership in Scranton, Pennsylvania. Well, That's naturally. the kind of star I am. It's a Toyota-thon? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> big time and he was guy. like, you're so fantastic. They should give you a free Pathfinder. I was like, Dad, that's not how this works. It's like, that's, I wish. I mean, right? Yeah. So, but we did. And a, a big part of that closeness was, you know, his illness. He was struggling with facing the facts that he was terminally ill. And as siblings, we all came together and we were there for him. And it was... You know, this is a U.S. Marshal coming up in a time when it was all this male bravado. Mm -hmm. Crazy situations that he was involved in. I mean, I remember, like, if he would just all of a sudden get these phone calls and he would have to leave and protect somebody in the government or whatever. Yeah. And he would say goodbye to all of us. And we knew that he might not come back. I mean, it was dangerous stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, back in my day in the 80s, I mean, there was the uh, attempt... Of assassination of President Reagan, and my father had to guard the individual that was to to who tried to kill him. Oh wow! And while he was in his process, and he tried to hang himself. My father was the one that cut the um, rope to save his life, which wasn't like something that people really cared that much about. Well, he was, but he tried to. It wasn't a rope; it was a sheet. Was that the one that and attempted it for? She did it for. Uh, they did it for Jodie Foster, right? <laughs> Is that the one? Uh, Someone made an assassin to maybe. Ronald Reagan for an actress. Maybe I was obsessed what with like, his name. I can't think of his name right now, and I should know it. My siblings are all going to be like, I can't believe you forgot, but it'll come to me all of a sudden. The most wild facts in your family. You I know. The it's one of the wild. Well, it's, so yeah. Because I know like with Reagan, there was an assassin attempt made because the person was doing it for a celebrity. It was like crazy delusion. They were obsessed. But either, either way. Either Google. Way. Yeah, Google, yeah, Google yeah, yeah, it, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> you didn't come to this interview for information. <laughs> Look it up yourself. <laughs> and we'll play a little. Yeah. Right there. But you said with your dad passing, but you did like manage to like make amends. Like what, what year or time was that? Was that pre or post drag race? I was post drag race. It was in sobriety, race. and uh, my sponsor in my program was like, "You can you look at your resentments." And I had such a strong resentment against my father, and there were certain things in my childhood that I wasn't responsible for. It was just childhood. But as I got older, I was not the kindest person to him, mm -hmm. and so I fostered that negativity, and so he began to show me that. I had to own my side of the street. And then part of that was forgiving him from, from the past and be in the moment with my dad. And uh, one, of my, the, one of the most beautiful moments was at that Toyota dealership, he came to the show and he came backstage and he said, wow, I'm dressed in drag. Wow, Eddie, you look beautiful. Not Kasha. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, during the show, I'm telling my stories and singing my songs, and he shook my hand, which is, you know, he always taught me a firm handshake, right. you know, that's manly handshake. So we did that. People kind of giggled. Mm -hmm. And it's a couple years you later. Yeah. yeah, we you, met you, in the middle. Yeah, we met in the middle. You meet people where they are. Sometimes. That's right. So. And a couple 
months or about a year after he passes and we find, you know, how you keep on the side of your bed, like special, a box of memories or in your bedroom or whatever. Mm -hmm. There was this piece of paper that was his friend sent him an email. Did you see Kasha at the Toyota dealership? And in the email, my dad responded, that's my son, Eddie, and I am so proud. And it was such a beautiful gift. I thought he would never be proud of me. And it wasn't only he was not only proud of Eddie, he was proud of Kasha. He was proud of really the this this culmination of all that femininity that I was like suppressing that I'm letting out through my drag with the hopes to inspire others to be themselves. And he recognized it and he was proud of it. And it was just beautiful. It was better than any pathfinder that could have given you. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. That was the that was the pathfinder that we you know, I don't know what the, the, real words, the real pathfinder real pathfinder real pathfinder was the love we found along the way and that's right yeah yeah <laughs> but with like your family obviously they didn't respond well whenever you had first came out initially but whenever you, they realized you were doing drag was that an even tougher pill to swallow or were they kind of just was it just par the course at that point? They were. They had nothing to do with it until that point. My mother, she would occasionally be like, um, "Eddie, do you want to bring some of these uh, lipsticks to your friends?" Mm -hmm. That's as close as she would. So she sort of knew probably from my sisters, mm -hmm. saying, "You know, do you see what Eddie's doing?" But um, she never attended a show, and really, we never really talked about it. Mm -hmm. And she passed away, and then my dad, we never really talked about it. He just was like, "Oh, you're a theater guy." Mm -hmm. You're doing your shows like that's about as close as you could say until that time. Yeah, I was gonna say like it I feel like that would have made the pill a little easier to swallow because of the fact that you were like such a big like theater kid back in the day <laughs> yeah, Hello Dolly. Back whenever you had a full set of hair. Oh my gosh <laughs> And now it's just all coming out of my ears and my back um, mm -hmm. uh, This and it's hello Dolly and that's Tiffany Griffiths and I was Horace Vandergelder mm -hmm. and I uh, actually auditioned for Dolly uh, and they were like, what? So, so you, you were trying to get into drag. I was trying. Way or another. I've always was, I was always trying to get it into drag. It was always destined. When we were little, I would get all the neighborhood kids and we would do, I would direct Hello Dolly. Mm -hmm. And we would all get together and put on these performances in the garage and dress up in the, these bridesmaids gowns. And I would dress up as Dolly and I'd be like, I'm just showing you how it's done. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to play the part, right? But I just want you to see how right the right, right way to do it, right? Right. <laughs> like just, just for yeah, I want to make sure this play goes as good as possible. Exactly. Yeah. You know. In the in the alley in you know Scranton, Pennsylvania. Yeah. <laughs> Where no no parents would come to it. They're like, we don't want to see this. You know. Right. <laughs> we either play Hello Dolly or church. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But drag obviously was not the initial plan. Even though you were destined obviously to do it, it was not the initial plan. But would you say that your career as an international drag superstar has been more exciting than working at a call center? <laughs> Is it? I had a blast. I worked at Dial America for 18 years, mm -hmm. and I got this part-time job in the process of our divorce, and then I got promoted, 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 and I was meant for management. I, I went to school for theater and business, and I directed some high school plays and some local theater and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I love to direct. You know, we're control freaks, right? We like to do yeah. that. It's your addiction. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. <laughs> and so, so I was like, oh my gosh, I love this. And it was inspiring because call center work is different now than what it was then. When we were, when I was involved with Dial America. Like, pull the lines and stuff anymore. <laughs> yeah, right. there was all that going on. No, what was great about it was that it was great part-time work. Mm. It was reputable work. I just... Whenever I hear like call center, I imagine just like the most monotonous lifestyle, but the fact that you loved it so much, like I just, <laughs> well, I got it, to it's be such a juxtaposition between where you are now that, you know, I got to be in charge. I, I was the director. Okay. So I started on the phones, but I quickly got off the phones. The phones were fun because you could play a different character all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, hello, you know, I'm calling upon, uh, for Verizon DSL. How are you today? You know? That's why you got promoted. They're like, we got to get this. You got to get him off the phones. He's... So yeah, he's ridiculous. And so I moved up, and then you know you're doing trainings, and you're executing new programs, and you're motivating people to hit sales goals, and like all that stuff is theatrical. Mm -hmm. So I just turned it into See, that. That's why you moved up so fast because you're the only person that found so much enjoyment <laughs> in working at a call center. <laughs> it but, was fun. It really was. Yeah, you're like, oh, it's like theater, and there's like, you just, no, but okay, yeah, okay, great. Yeah, yeah go off, queen. <laughs> <laughs> it really, I mean, we had, we had a lot of really great experiences and fun times, but, uh -huh. you know, it's, uh, it was time for me to move on. But obviously, all good things must come to an end, and fortunately, you did pursue your career in drag. But with Drag Race, you auditioned from season one up to season seven. Like, right. every year you send an audition tape, where do you think you would be at 
in life had you not sent in that last tape? If you gave up on try number six, would you still be working in that call center or would you be somewhere else? I wouldn't have stopped trying. I have a friend, Aggie Dune, who's still auditioning. She's oh, okay. absolutely one of the most amazing drag queens I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. And the fact of the matter is she's older. Mm -hmm. And is that the reason why she's not getting on? Probably. I don't know. Uh, it's certainly not a matter of talent. What I have maybe done some more theater locally, like community theater, I probably still would have left Dial America and pursued something different. Um, I don't know that I'd get sober, though. So that's the magic and the beauty of Drag Race. It got me to look at I was following my dreams and I was like slammed down into my reality of, of hitting bottom. Mm -hmm. Thank God for RuPaul's Drag Race for, for having that opportunity because it was really, really woke me up to, I was wasting uh, what I was meant to do. And I think it, it's just to, meant to perform and inspire. Mm -hmm. With your initial season, like you had a decent run, you made it like episode five. Now you've taken on this new career. Whenever you went back to All Stars 8, like what did you hope to show people whenever you came back? I mean, the first line when I came in, my name is Mrs. Kosh Davis and I'm an alcoholic. I wanted to talk about that. I wanted to show that progress personally. Mm -hmm. I wanted to also show the progression of drag. I mean, at the time when I was cast on season seven, we were doing a couple of nights at this club called Mothers and my friend Aggie and I were performing at a Italian uh, party house doing like impersonations of Liza Minnelli and Tina Turner. Mm -hmm. You know, we were doing that kind of stuff and I still am doing that. But for the most part, that was it. So I, I didn't understand so much about drag. I learned so much in the period between season seven and All Stars 8 about all there is that I'm learning about drag and how drag is so much bigger than I thought it was and so much more. There's so much create, much more creativity. I mean, look at you. I mean, just you, you truly, you're stunning. But you're also just leading the way and being authentically yourself and boldly being a drag artist. and yeah, a, boldly going where many people have gone before. <laughs> I'm a straight yeah. man. <laughs> oh, well. Yeah, it's I mean, cool. Yeah. I mean, it's you're cool. straight too, so you get it. Yeah. It's inspiring. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's you're just being authentically yourself. And I think that that is, that is really cool. And so, yeah, I think that, I, I, I don't know. I, 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 it's fascinating to me to to look to imagine looking back to see what would have been. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just, I, I think it's one thing with All-Stars, obviously you want to go back, show that you can do some things that you might have missed out on or how your drag has changed, but also to show that you know, you're more than you were before. Right. And like the growth, because you went from 11th place to 10th and you know, that's nothing to sneak <laughs> about, you know? <laughs> I am not the best competitor with RuPaul's Drag Race. Mm -hmm. I get too team oriented. I don't, mm -hmm. I, I, it's very difficult for me to say it's all about me. Drag Race is all about you. And it's all about fighting for yourself and lying to, you know, the, the, to, to your, like, making these fake alliances and all this stuff. And I'm oblivious to that stuff. Mm -hmm. And so I'm proud, I'm very proud of my All Stars 8 moment. Do you wish you were more manipulative? You could have gone further. I wish. In hindsight, would you have lied more? Cheated, no. stole, <laughs> attacked, no. physically I couldn't do it. I couldn't no. do it. One thing, if I look back, the reason why I burst into tears in the saying there's always time for kindness is not that, not only that I think that the world needs more kindness, but I was mad at myself for not fighting harder. I felt as though I could have fought harder for myself, but I was up against one of my best friends. And I was like, well, you know, Darian should get it then. And I, and I, I got upset with myself that I didn't be like, no, I am here. I've worked hard. I've done this, that, and the other. I deserve this. And so that is something that I have taken from that. And I'm trying to work on that now. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to be more like that. But it's, I mean, as you know, like, I will be like, oh, what about Darian? Or here's my friend Aggie. You know, I always mention everybody else. And I think that that is a plus a part of my personality, mm -hmm. but it's something that in the, in the world of making it as your own artist, you have to be a little bit more selfish. Mm -hmm. that, yeah, that's the big takeaway from this interview, you guys. You should be more selfish. <laughs> Stop caring about other people. <laughs> no, but I think you, you there, there there's is always time for selfish. There's always time for selfish bitterness. The real Mrs. Kasha Davis, honestly. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, why do you think I talk about kindness and gratitude so much? Because it's something I've had to work on. Because mm -hmm. I, you know, yeah. uh, I could be a jerk. <laughs> uh, uh, but no, honestly, like that, that was tough for me. That was tough. That moment was really, really tough because I was so disappointed that I didn't fight harder for myself. Mm -hmm. And then I felt as though I said, just give it to Darian. Mm -hmm. I mean, she placed like fifth on her season. Like she, she would have been fine. You should have yeah. just, <laughs> like, you should be like, you placed eleventh. Yeah, gonna, exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I got more to work for. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I feel though that in the end, I couldn't be happier. Listen, I got a shoot for the most fabulous outfit on the season. Mm -hmm. This is a shoot, you know. On the yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, it's horrible. And um, that phrase, "There's always time for kindness," and people are just so sweet. I've I've had such wonderful responses from people. So. Mm -hmm. I can't, I have no complaints. As you mentioned, like you've been a huge advocate for other people and one of the biggest things is advocates for the youth and using your platform of Drag Race, you've been a huge proponent of like Drag Race Story Hour, for instance. Right. And like you even made a television series about educating children and yeah. talking to children. Why do you think that it's so important for you as a drag performer to try to bridge that gap with the youth? It's so important because I know the struggle that I had and that my father had. And I have been doing Drag Story Hour at Blackfriars Theater for seven years. And we've had dads come up specifically in tears saying, thank you for showing me, showing me that my child has a community. Opening people's eyes to the fact that all we're asking you to do is to love your children for exactly who they are and how they are. And so we would have l had so much less negativity as a father and son if there was a drag story hour if there was these people living these bold authentic lives and not it not being a joke because back in the 70s and 80s it was all a joke it was anyone who was any version of queer was considered a joke or it was a tragic situation and so many celebrities back then they were all in the closet and so to me to to be out loud and proud about everything, it, I think, is only helping others in their journey. And so we have recorded, filmed four episodes of Imagination Station, and we've had interviews where people say, so now what's the agenda? Are you teaching kids to be a drag queen? No. Our agenda is simple. If you happen to see someone different in the world, treat them with kindness. And Mrs. Kasha Davis is just Mrs. Kasha Davis. There's no explanation of Mrs. Kasha Davis. And any of the other characters that are within the show are just who they are, how they are. And I think that's so important in that, in that process. And so, knock on wood, we are literally this close, literally emails of the final drafts of a contract where a production company will go to sell it to streaming platforms. And like, huge, when, if that can happen, to be a, a drag queen hosting a children's television program. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's something that the world can use. It can open a lot of eyes and minds. And I think saves, and honestly, in, in many cases, save lives. Because there are people in small towns who think that there's, there's so much shame for them to be exactly who they are. And uh, it's, it's that battle of mental health. As you said, you've been doing the Drag Queen Story Hour for about seven years now. And obviously, the mindset towards things like that has shifted so much politically in the past just few years. But how has that impacted like the Story Hour? Like, what are the changes you've noticed seven years ago versus today? Yeah. Well, it's become political. Drag is this political topic. And the fact of the matter is, it's because it's become more mainstream. And I believe that I have learned in my life that when people are scared, they get angry. And so are, what are they afraid of? Are they afraid of being found out? Uh, certainly they're making these accusations about drag queens uh, having these, these grooming scenarios with children that are just unfounded. There are no, there are, there, it's not happening. Mm -hmm. And so there's so much fear and it's fear of unknown and maybe fear, I believe, of being found out. And the fact is, I love what RuPaul says, we're all born naked and the rest is drag. I mean, everything in one shape or another is drag. And I think that what we're seeing is progress. And sometimes when there's progress, we go through tough moments and we have to continue to trudge through and continue to be 
bold and to be ourselves and to continue to be safe. You know, it's important we have some of the adjustments we've made is we have security just in case and different things like that. But we're not going to back down. We're going to continue to do to do the work. What's sad in my community, I've been doing it for seven years. We had two protesters, two people. And it wasn't that big of a deal. More recently, a drag, two drag artists attempted to do a story hour, and one was a person of color and one was a trans person. And it be blew up all over the news. And there were horrible, hateful things being posted all around the town. And the, the town made this giant bill for security that was, it was impossible for them to pay. They ended up moving it to another location, a private location. But the fact of the matter is, when I was interviewed, I said, that is not a problem with drag. That is racism, and that is our, that's transphobia, is what's going on right there. Let's not, let's not confuse things. Mm -hmm. That is what's happening so much in this country, is that we're confusing things, and we're lumping it all into, into the one bucket of drag. And, and like scapegoating it all. Yeah. And it's just so, it's, it's so important for us to continue to do, to do the work that you're doing. And this is amazing. And I, can, I will continue to say that. I know you, this is, uh, this is a passion project for you, but it's truly showing people out there that, wow, here's this person being authentically themselves and having fun and dressing up and really having these really meaningful conversations. And some of it's fun and it's entertaining, but it's powerful stuff showing the world that we can be exactly who we are, however we choose to dress, however we choose to present ourselves. Mm. This is where I insert quip here. This is where I say something witty and funny, but <laughs> we'll let it in post. Yeah. But <laughs> yeah. Well, I think, honestly, I think it's a really powerful message to end on. So I think we'll just, again, like that's the last of my cards anyway. So yeah. end of the interview. Before you go, I do want to give you a gift, a little parting gift to thank you for coming in today. I just said earlier, you're a huge mama's boy. Yes. And you briefly mentioned, too, that she was an Avon lady. So yes. I to give you an Avon lipstick. Ah, They're and it's ultra, ultra, ultra matte. which is Ultra matte. It's very you. It is. But just as a thank you. And again, just like in remembrance and honor of, you know, the late <sighs> Mama Kasha Davis. That's right. Ellen Louise Popel. She, my first lipstick was a sample size mm -hmm. that she would have. And it was a bright red, like it says Red Supreme on here. And I used to take a towel and tie it up over my head and have that. And the first song that I lip synced alone in my room was mm -hmm. I'm Coming Out, Diana Ross. Mm -hmm. Of course, right? That's what you do. Naturally. And naturally. And it was that little red lipstick. And she'd catch me in the bathroom and she's like, you're talking to yourself in there. Crazy people talk to themselves. I'm like, well, then, then I'm crazy, Bob. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, she was just magnificent. This is so special. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Hopefully it's hopefully it's a, a, uh, the right shade for you. I mean, red <laughs> red supreme. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. <laughs> it's a, yeah, and it says supporting alternatives to animal testing. Great. Mm -hmm. And as an animal yourself, you're like perfect. <laughs> I'll do the animal testing. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. So, yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Thank you so much. But yeah, that is the end of our time. So uh, where can people find you? Because obviously you're pitching your show, so it's tentative on the show, but. Social media, do you have any shows coming up? Like, yeah. do you have a ca wide camera there or your main camera there? Let people know. Where can they find you at? You can find me on the interwebs, on Insta Snatch, Twitter, and FacePlace, all Mrs. Kasha Davis. Mm. AOL Messenger. The, the AOL Messenger, yeah. Uh, Rock Drag Me to Brunch is our drag uh, group. And look forward to Imagination Station. There's an Instagram for that too, Imagination Station 201. And you can find me right here. Make sure to like and definitely subscribe so you can see all the upcoming interviews we have. We have a lot of exciting guests. And join us probably next week or the week after whenever we have somebody else. <laughs> and yeah. And most importantly, remember, there's always time for selfishness. There's always time for kindness. <laughs> this is very kind. Bye, guys. There's always time for selfishness. I there's like always that. time for selfishness. Yeah. That's my takeaway. It means you have a big pickle.